Well, hello everybody. Sorry I'm late, but I had the dogs in. So. So hopefully everybody is doing awesome. Get my glasses here. Tonight we will be reading this. The story by Bentley Little. Hey Terry. And we will be just started at the prologue. Now to give me a minute. I'm gonna turn off the camera. I'm still gonna be here. I just have to go find something real quick. That should have been real close, but then. Oh. Oh. Where in the world is this going to take you to? How many of us have to get by you? I needed a bookmark. <laughs> and I got one. <laughs> Sorry. And I need to change my icon anyway. Back to my book icon. back on the camera uh found a bookmark to be continued it says and i will be starting on page one of this which is the prologue and hopefully we get to go through the first chapter at least before my eyes gives up so and yes i'm going to be reading it out loud yeah. so i'm gonna see how long my eyes left me so i just want to see how many people's in here So, he's all excited about hearing this story. I see that there. Let me let the dog out of my room. She's been a pain in my butt. Come on. Come on, drink. Then you're stuck with me. Yeah, my baby's definitely. Oh, yeah, talk to the baby. Yes, I see the baby. <laughs> yes. Oh, you're so beautiful. Yes, my baby girl, beautiful baby. She's just a beautiful baby. Oh. So let's get started, shall we? It's 7.37, and uh, this was supposed to start at 
and we're gonna get going uh, but what I'm gonna do is put an overlay here of the book and go like that that way you can still hear me but you get, you're concentrating on the book itself and let's get started shall we page one prologue the DeSanto drove along the rutted dirt road through the series of low desert hills that signaled an end to the Texas flatlands. A cloud of dust accompanied the car, enveloping the vehicle and not merely following in its wake. But the dust was preferable to the heat and the windows remained open. It was the third day of their honeymoon, and although Nancy didn't want to admit it, she and she and Paul seemed to have run out of things to say to each other. They had not spoken since Houston, save for Paul's occasional request to hand him the map, and though she tried to come up with something that they could talk about, there seemed to be no subjects that would sustain a conversation more than a few minutes. She figured she'd better save those for El Paso and dinner. She fanned herself with the map, the unbearable temperature didn't help any e either. She couldn't think it in weather like this. She'd never been so hot and uncomfortable in her life. She would have liked to take off her top and her bra. The old Paul would have liked it too. It was the type of wild spontaneity that newlyweds were supposed to engage in. The sort of man cat attic that would make the honeymoon memorable. That they would be able to look back at and laugh about years later. No one else would see her. They hadn't come across a single other car for the past two hours. But even without asking, she knew that Paul would not approve. They were supposed to have been ma married three years ago. But he'd been drafted, sent, sent off to Korea. And though she would wanted to marry me before he shipped out, he, he wanted to wait, just in case each time she mentioned it, he'd remind her of Scarlett O'Hara's first husband and gone with the wind. The boy she'd married just before he'd gone off to his death in the Civil War. And though Nancy knew he was joking, his underlying meaning was serious, and it terrified her to think that he might not return. Return he had of the... Return he had, though alive and unharmed, but there'd been something different about him ever after the war. He seemed to change somehow, although it wasn't something she could really put her finger on. She no she noticed it immediately and considered asking him about it, about it. but she figured if she wanted to talk, he would, and she decided to let him be. She was just happy that they were together again, man and wife. And if the silence were a little too long, they were comfortable silence. And she knew that once they started their new life in California, once they made friends and, and had kids that settled into marriage, that those silences would disappear. Ahead, of, ahead at the foot of Sandstone Cliff, on the right side of the road was a small brick building that appeared in Congress out, out there in the middle of nowhere. A stri strip of green grass for front of the structure bisected by a short white sidewalk. There were no windows on the building, only a large black and on white sign and the wall to the right of the door. That's odd, Paul said, slowing the car. Nancy nodded. This, this close, they would read the words on the sign. The store, groceries, pharmaceuticals, McIntyre. 
Mercatel, Paul Leth, the store, what kind of name is that? It's straightforward and honest, she pointed out. Yeah, I guess it, it is that. But you'd never make it in a big city with a name like the store. You'd need something catchier, something with more pizzazz. He laughed again and shook his head. The store. Why don't we stop, Nancy suggested. Maybe they have cold soda. A nice cold soda sounds real good right now. Okay, there is no parking lot, but Paul pulled off the side of the dirt road and stopped directly in front of the small building. He turned toward Nancy. What do you want? I'll go in with you, she said. He placed a firm hand on her arm. No, you stay here in the car. I'll get us the sodas. What do you want? yoo hoo you she said. yoo hoo it is. He opened the driver's door and got out. I'll be back in a flash. He smiled at her, and she smiled back as, as he walked down the short sidewalk, but her smile faded as she, she watched him open the glass door and step into the store, disappearing into, a, into the murky dimness of the building. She suddenly realized just how odd this place was. They were 50, maybe 100 miles from the nearest town. There were no visible telephone lines or electrical wires. She could not believe that there was water, and there certainly was not any traffic. Yet the store was open and ready for business, as if it were in the middle of downtown Pittsburgh and not in the middle of the Texas desert. Something about that made her uneasy. She stared hard at the door, trying to see into the store. But she could make out nothing, no shapes, no sign of movement. It was the glass, she told herself, and the angle of the sun. That was all. Besides, if the interior of the building were really as dark as it looked from out here, Paul would not have gone inside. She tried to make herself believe it. Paul emerged several minutes later, looking stunned. Carrying a large paper sack, he opened the driver's door of the DeSanto and sat down, placing the sack between them. You were just supposed to get sodas, she said. He started the car. Paul? He didn't respond, and she began digging through the sack. Light bulbs? What do we need light bulbs for? We're on vacation. Tissue paper? Whisk room? Masking tape? What is all this? He glanced firstly back toward toward. The store, as he put the car into his gear, let's just get out of here. Nancy felt the chill pass to her, but I don't understand why. Hey, Paul. Did you buy all this, and where are our sodas? You didn't even buy our sodas. He looked over at her, and there was fear in his face, fear and anger. And, uh, and for the first time since they'd gotten married, for the first time since she'd known Paul, she was afraid of him. Shut up, Nancy. Just shut the hell up. She said nothing but turned around to look as they sped away. Before the car rounded the curve of the hill, before the dust completely obscured the scene behind them, she saw the door of the building open, and in, and in the sight, she would remember until the, her dying day. She thought she saw a proprietor of the store. Oh, that was the prologue. I'm about to start chapter one. Oh. Okay. I hope you're doing well this evening, Paul. Page 5, Chapter 1. Bill Davis quietly chased the front. Okay, let's see. My eyes are blurring on me. 
Bill Davis quietly closed the front door of the house behind him as he stepped outside. He walked off the porch and stood for a moment. At the head of the drive, during during knee bends and breathing deeply, the air exhaling from his lungs in bursts of visible steam. When he reached the count of 50, he stopped. Standing straight, he bent to the left, bent to the right, then walked down the drive to the road, where he inhaled and exhaled one last time be before beginning his, his morning jog. The dirt changed to asphalt at the bottom of the hill, and he ran past Godwin's meadow and turned into, into Maine. He liked running at this time of the morning. He didn't like the r r running itself. That was a necessary evil, but he enjoyed being out and about at this hour. The streets were virtually empty. <laughs> Landman Manson was in the donut shop finishing up the morning baking as the first few customers struggled in. Chris Snyder was loading, loading up the newspaper racks, and here and there individual trucks were headed off to a construction site. But otherwise, the town was quiet, the streets clear, and that w was the way he liked it. He ran through downtown Ju Juniper and kept going until he hit the highway. The air was chill and but, but heavy, weighted with the, the rich scent of moist vegetation. The smell of newly cut grass, he breathed deeply as he jogged. He could see his breath as he ran and the brisk air felt invigorating, made him glad to be alive. On the other highway, the view opened up, the close-set trees that had been lining the road, falling back, making visible the sloping landscape ahead. The sun was rising behind broken clouds that floated unmoving over the mountains. The clouds situated against the pale sky, black in the center, pink orange at the edges. In front of the sunrise, a flock of geese was flying south in a, in a morphin V formation. Sorry that I'm reading terribly, but my eyesight ain't that good. But I'm doing my best. The shape of the flight pattern varies every few seconds as a different bird moved into the lead, and the other members of the flock fell in behind it. Shafts of yellow light slanted downward through the clouds, through the pine branches, highlighting objects and areas unused to a to attention. A boulder, a golly, a collapsing barn. A collapsed barn. This was his favorite part of the job. The open land between the end of the town proper and the small unincorporated sub subdivision known as Creekside Acres. The dirt control road on the other side of the acres that looked back to his to his street was wider. The more forested, but there was something about this mile or so stretch that appealed to him. Here, the tall trees ringed an overgrown meadow that sloped up the side of a low hill. An outcropping of rock on the south side of the meadow stood like some primitive idol. Its erosion curved, vacated, given it the appearance of something deliberately kept sculptured. He slowed down a little, not because he was tired, but because he wanted to savor the moment. Glancing to his left, he saw the bright, it, the brightening sunlight ca captured the amplified, amplified by the brilliant yellow. Aspens that were in interspersed among the pines. He shifted his gaze across the highway to his right, to 
toward the middle. But something, but something here was different. Something was wrong. He couldn't put his finger on it. But he noticed instantly that there was an element in the middle that was out of place and did not fit. The sign had changed. Yes, that it, that was it. He stopped jogging, breathing heavily. The weather worn sign announced the bailiff's opening in six months that had been posted in the middle for the past decade was gone. Replaced with a new sign, a stark white rectangle with black lettering that said solemnly atop twin supports sunk deep into the ground. The store is coming February. He stared for a moment at the sign. It had not been here yesterday, and something about the cold precision of the type and the flat de declarative promise of the message made him feel a little uneasy. Although he wasn't quite sure why it was stupid, he knew in ordinary he was not one to go by hunches or intuition or something so non-concrete, but the sign bothered him. It was, he supposed, a reaction to the idea of something, anything being built here in the meadow, in what he considered his spot. Sure, a daneless grocery store was supposed to have been built at this location, but ground for the for construction had never been broken, and the sign had been there for so long that it that its promise was empty. Its words had ceased to have any meaning. The sign had become part of the landscape. It was now merely another picturesque a picture. Q relic by the side of the road, like the fallen barn up ahead or the old blank, blanky gas station that had collapsed into the brush on the highway west of town. He glanced around, trying to imagine a huge new building in the middle of the middle. The grass around it paved over for a parking lot, and it was de desperately easy to conjure up such a picture in his mind. Instead of seeing the glistening sparkle of dew on the grass, he'd see black asphalt and white paint lines stretching before him as he jogged each morning. His view of the hill and the rocks would probably be blocked by the square concrete bulk of the store. The mountains up ahead would be unchanged, and they were only a small part of the beauty of, of the spot. It was the convention of everything, the perfect integration of all elements that had made his stretch such a special place for, for him. He looked again at the sign. Behind it, between the posts, he saw the body of a dead deer. He had not noticed it before. But the shifting clouds and the rising, rising sun had changed the emphasis of the light. And the brown form was now clearly visible. It's, it's, it's distended stomach and unmoving head protruding from the middle grass. The animal had obviously died recently, probably during the night. There were no flies anywhere, no sign of decay, no wounds. The death was clean. And that somehow seemed more ominous to him than if it had been shot or hit by a car or crippled and attacked by wolves. How often did animals drop dead of natural causes? next to construction announcement signs. He would have called it an omen, had he believed in omens.
but he did not and and he felt stupid for even thinking about it for even pretending in his mind that there was a casual connection between the two taking a deep breath he ate, he resumed juggling heading down the sloping highway toward the acres looking ahead at the mountains but they remained troubled but he remained troubled let me get a drink welcome to the two Oh, I'm going to try another pair of glasses to see if they help. And that just made it worse. Let me try these ones. And no, I'm sitting double with those ones. Go back to the specs with bifocals. Hey, Judy. How are you? Chapter 2. Jenny was already up and had cooked breakfast by the time he returned. Samantha was peacefully eating her cream of wheat in front of the television. But Jenny and Shannon were arguing in the kitchen. Shannon insisting that she didn't have to eat breakfast if she didn't want to. That she was old enough to decide for herself whether or not she was hungry. Jenny lecturing her about bulimia and and anorexia. Both of them assault assaulted him the second he walked into the house. Dad, Shannon said, tell mom that I don't have to eat a big breakfast every single day. We had a huge dinner last night and mom's not even hungry. And tell Shannon, Jenny said, that she's going to end up with an eating disorder if she doesn't stop obsessing over her weight. He held up his hands. I'm not stepping into this. This is between you two. I'm taking a shower. Dad, you're always chicken out, Jenny said. You're not dragging me into this. He grabbed the towel from the hall closet and hurried into the bathroom. Locking the door, he turned on the water, drowning out the noise from the kitchen. They quickly took off his jogging suit and got into the steaming shower. The hot spray felt good. He closed his eyes and faced into the water, the tiny streams simultaneously hitting his forehead, his eyelids, his nose, his cheeks, his lips, his chin. The water ran down his body, pulling around his feet, low, low rainfall in the spring and summer months. And low snowfall last winter had led to a reduction in the water table. Good, glad to hear that. Judy and ra rationing for the houses houses in town but they had their own water from their own well and he stood there for a long time luxurating in the shower letting the heated liquid caress his tired muscles the girls had taken off for school by the time he finished the shower and he walked into the kitchen and poured him a cup of coffee I could have used some support, Jenny said, as she put the girl's dishes into the dishwasher. She's not interested, for God's sake. But she could, could be. You're overreacting. Am I? She skips lunch now. Almost every day, and now she wants to skip breakfast. The dinner's the only meal she eats anymore. I don't want to burst your bubble, Jen, but she's chubby. Jenny looked quickly around as though Shannon might have surprisingly returned in order to eavesdrop on their conversation. Don't let her hear you say that. I won't 
but it's true. She's obviously eating more than dinner. I just don't like the way she's always worrying about the number of meals she eats and the size of her food portions and her weight and her appearance. But stop harping about it. You're the one drawing the attention to her. She probably wouldn't be as cautious of it if you weren't focusing on her all the time. Bullshit. She, she'd eat one meal a week if I let her get away with it. Bill shrugged. Your call. He checked the pot on the stove. A small dollop of hardened, hardened cream of wheat lay clumped against one rounded side of the metal cookware. He grimaced. It's not as bad as it looks, Jenny said. Pour, pour in a bit of milk and heat, and heat it up. He, he shook his head. I'll just have toast. The, the open bread sack was still on the counter, and he took out two pieces, popping them in the toaster. I saw a new sign when I was out jogging. It said the storm was coming. That's right. I forgot to tell you. Char Charlinda told me about it Friday. Ted's company is bidding on the, roof, roof, on the roofing contract. And she said that he stands to make more from this one project that he did all last year if he gets it. I'm sure a lot of construction workers around here, here, will will be happy. I thought you'd be happy too. You're always complaining about the high prices in town and moaning that we have to drive down to Phoenix in order to find decent selections of anything. I am happy, he told her. But he was not intensely. He supposed he could up. Appreciate the coming of the store. It would be a big boost to the local economy and would mean not only a temporary increase in construction jobs, but a permanent expansion of sales. The service position, particularly for teenagers, it would also be good for customers. It would bring big city discount prices and a big city selection of products to their small town. On a gut level, however, the arrival of the store did not sit well with him, and not just because it was going to be built on his scenic spot. For no reason that he could rationally justify, he did not want the chain store in Jupiter. He thought of the sign, thought of, thought of the deer. Well, I'm sure local shop owners aren't too thrilled, Jenny said. The store will probably put some of them out of business. That's true. Just what we need in town. More abandoned buildings. His his toast popped up and Bill took a butter knife out of the silverware drawer, grabbed the jar of jam from the refrigerator. I'd better get ready, Jenny said. Walking around him, she went into the bathroom and he heard her brushing her teeth as he prepared his toast. She emerged a few minutes later, makeup on, purse in hand. hi -o, hi -o, it's off to work, I go. Me too, he walked over, kissed her. Will you come home for lunch? He smiled. I think, I think that's safe. That's a safe bet. Good, then you can finish the dishes. Ah, the joys of tele commuting. He followed her to the front door. Kissed her again, then watched through the screen as she walked down the porch steps and then across the drive to the car. He waved as she drove away, then closed the door, finishing eating his toast, washed his hands to, in the kitchen sink, and walked through the living room and down the hall to his office. He sat down at his desk, turning on the PC. As always, he, he, he felt a thrill of almost guilty pleasure. The computer booted up as though he was getting away with something he shouldn't. He shriveled in his chair, looked out the window. This might not be exactly his, the life he had imagined, but it was pretty damn close. In his mind, the house had been large glass walled. Frank Lloyd Wright, Wrightish structure, 
and he'd been seated at a huge oak desk looking out a giant window into the forest where while wow, classical music lasted into the room from a state-of-the-art stereo. In reality, he worked out of his cramped back room, the walls of the office little, more than a, an extension of his bulletin board, with magazine articles and post-it notes affixed to nearly every conceivable space, and he wasn't nearly as cultured in his real life as he was in, in his fantasies. Instead of classical music, he usually listened to classic rock on a portable radio his daughters had discarded. But everything else was on the mark. The room did, did intend to have a big window, and that big window did look out onto the forest. And most importantly, he was doing what he wanted, where he wanted. His reach may have exceeded his grasp, but he had not sold out. He had not given up his dream and settled for a lesser fate. Choosing the least offensive alternative, he had stuck to his guns, and here he was. The, tel the telecommuting technical writer, working for one of the country's largest software firms, a thousand miles away from the corporate office, communicating with his peers by modem and fax. The computer finished good enough, and he checked his email. There were two messages from the company, reminding him of his dead deadline, no doubt, and a message from Street McHenry, who owned the electronics store in town. Finally, he called up Street's message. It was two words long, chess tonight. Bill typed a quick reply and sent it back. See you there. Okay, I guess I'm. I guess this is uh, part two, not chapter two. By the way, it, it's still chapter one, but part two. He and the street had to separate chess matches going over most of the past year. One on one online, and one on a traditional board. Neither of them were really chess f fanatics, and they probably would have stopped a long time ago were it not for the interesting and unexplainable fact he won all the computer games. Street won all the board games. It shouldn't have worked out that way. The mediums were different, but the game was exactly the same. Chess was chess, no matter what pieces were used or where it was played. Still, that was the way it broke down. Every time. They, uh, the oddity was enough to keep both of them interested in the matches. Bill fired off a quick email met message to Ben Anderson, informing him of tonight's game. The newspaper editor, the other member of the, their online trim of red, Trump, uh, Tri Triumvirate had only recently learned of the great Gutenberg chess mystery, as he called it, but he was fascinated. He he was fascinated by it and wanted to be present at all board games and eavesdrop on all online matches. So it to see if he could detect any patterns in their playing, any logical reason why they won and lost as they did. The situation until the point had seemed lighthearted. Their approach to it curious, but not serious. Their manner half joken, but as Bill shared, stared at his email screen and thought of the past year of chess, of chess games, he was reminded for some reason of the story. The sign, the deer. Suddenly, their their win loss pattern didn't seem quite so benign, and he wished he had cancelled out on tonight's match instead of agreeing to it. 
he already knew what the outcome would be and he now not and he know and he now found that that a little unsettling he looked out at the trees for a moment before finally turning back to the computer he wasn't in a mood to jump straight into his work so instead of calling up his two messages from the company he 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 exited email and logged on to freelink his online service in order to check out this morning's news he scanned the wire service headlines third store massacre in a month the words jumped out at him there were other headlines more important stories but he did not see them and did not care feeling cold he displayed the next the text of the article Apparently, a sales clerk from, from the store in Los Canos, New Mexico, had come to work with a 45 caliber pistol tucked into the waistband of his pants, hidden beneath his uniform jacket. The clerk had worked from, from 8 to 10 in the morning, as always, then on his break had taken out the gun and started shooting his fellow employees. Six people were hit before... The clerk stopped to reload, and members of the store's security team roused into the ground. Five of those six people were dead. The sixth was in critical condition at a local hospital. According to the article, similar incidents had occurred at the chain stores in Denton, Texas, and Red Bluff, Utah. Within the past month in the Texas store, it was a customer who had started firing on employees, killing three and wounding two in Utah. It was a stock boy who had opened fire on customers. The stock boy had had a semi-automatic weapon and he had managed to mow down 15 people before being shot by an off-duty policemen. Corporate officials of the store would not comment on the incidents, but had issued, issued a press release stating that the possibility that the occurrence were related was being investigated. Bill read the story again, still feeling cold, the deer. He signed off Freelink and stared at the blank screen in front of him for several long minutes before finally getting back into email and assessing his messages from the company to start his morning's work. Okay. That is chapter one. We will read chapter two tomorrow night because my eyes ain't letting me see, see very much at all and uh oh but that was the prologue and chapter one i hope everybody enjoyed it and uh, i'm gonna get off of here and my eyes are blurry, so even the screen is blurry. So anyway, tomorrow night, let's see, at 8 o'clock, we will read chapter 2 and see what happens. Thank you for being here. And I hope you're enjoying this store by Bitly Little. <laughs>